Jesus took time with his disciples for another important lesson. He wanted them to have a different mindset. And I want you to know this, that the Lord brought you purposely today for you to have a new mindset. The foot washing mindset. In your feet, there also should be a mind. Did you know that your feet has a mind? You don't want to go there and somehow, <laughs> are they? and you've reached, and you've gone to the wrong place, and you've met with the wrong people, and you've indulged with the wrong things. It does happen, even for believers. Foot washing mindset. Now when Jesus celebrated the final Passover with his disciples, he introduced foot washing, which was an unusual form of ministering among them. Now listen, in a society where religious leaders are paranoid, they were paranoid about being ceremonially clean. Now washing his dirty disciples' feet can appear counterintuitive. It can be almost illegal against God's law. Remember when the disciples were walking through a plantation, through a paddy field, and they pluck a few grains, head of weeds, and start eating them, drying them in their hands, removing the husk and just eating some of the raw wheat head. The Pharisees, the Sadducees and the scribes got so angry. They said, how can your disciples eat something without washing their hands? They're very, very particular about that. And right here, Jesus, in the middle of a meal, he went and touched people's feet. But more than pursuing good hygiene for a ritual meal, Jesus had other plans in mind. As he taught his very own something that can only come from the culture of the kingdom of heaven. It was during the Passover meal that Jesus abruptly got up from where he was and did what was never expected of a rabbi for his disciples. Let me read for you the gospel of John chapter 13 verses 4 to 5. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples feet drying them with the towel he had around him. During that time, roads and highways were not paved and just a few were covered in cobblestones, only those within the city limits. Now since most people traveled around on foot, they would reach their destination with their feet all dirty and dusty. It would not be wrong to assume that some feet are encrusted in mud, slime, and even animal dung. Hence, it can be understood that foot washing was the duty of a servant and usually those of the lowest rank, even a slave. In some ways, it was even beneath a servant to tend to such a menial task. A dirty task. That is why many of the Old Testament examples of foot washing show people washing their own feet. You find this in Genesis chapter 18 verse 4. Study this at home. Chapter 24 verse 32. Chapter 43 verse 24. Pick these up and you can do your own Bible study later. Now, Peter, who had already come to acknowledge Jesus as the Christ, 
the son of the living God, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, he was extremely uncomfortable with what Jesus was doing. The apostle Peter, I can understand his hang up with Jesus touching his feet, least of all, washing them. And so he was very, very uncomfortable with what Jesus was doing. And I believe that the other disciples also felt the same thing, the same way. So they cannot fathom how their Lord and Master should stoop so low as to wash and clean their dirty feet. Since the evening meal was a close meeting, and it wasn't just an ordinary evening meal, it was the Passover. And I've already developed this research, I told you, where Jesus kept secret about the location of the upper room to avoid detractors and betrayers and traitors from discovering where he would be. At the last minute of that particular Passover feast, because he didn't want for these people to come and uh, snatch him before his time. And so therefore, I believe that the Passover meal at the upper room on that particular Thursday evening was a hush-hush affair. And so because it was a close meeting just between the disciples and the Lord, perhaps no servant was available to tend to such a menial task. But it was customary for them to wash and cleanse their hands and even their feet before partaking of the food. It wasn't just hygienic, it was a part of their tradition, their customs and their laws. As such, they ought to be the ones because they were his disciples, his followers, his mentees. And so they ought to be the ones who should have washed their master's feet, but none of them volunteered. Surprise, surprise. We'll find out why in a short while from now. Jesus must have started with the feet of the ones who were seated nearest to him. Most probably John, the beloved. Then as soon as he approached Peter, as usual, he must have impulsively refused the Lord from touching his feet. But Jesus answered in the gospel of John in chapter 13 and verse 8, he says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. This act of lowly service of the Lord can be considered to be an initiation for the disciples to enter into kingdom ministerial services as they have never known before. Again, this is what the Holy Spirit told me day before yesterday. The act of foot washing was actually a sort of initiation, a sort of an opening ceremony, an opening function, an inauguration, let's say, for these disciples to enter into kingdom ministerial services like they've never known before. These guys are not only just going to go now and uh, pray for the sick and the needy like they did when they were sent by Jesus, 72 of them, two by two. But now they're not only just going to do that after Jesus get raised from the grave, after um, he ascend to heaven, they'll be doing the teaching. They'll be doing the preaching. They'll be doing the counseling. They'll be doing the mentoring. They'll be do doing the ministering. They're going to teach new doctrines, the doctrines of the kingdom that will flow out of the anointing of Jesus' spirit over them after Pentecost. So therefore, I see, I mean, the Holy Spirit showed this to me, that that moment when Jesus took an ordinary Jewish ritual and made it to become an inauguration, ordination service for them into action ministry. Wow. How? I'll get back to you a little later. Now there are a few things that we can learn about this meaningful event. Okay? So, 
First, I've just read to you just now from John chapter 13. So if you look at that scripture portion that we started, so he got up from the table, took off his robe. Look here, got up from the table. He was sitting at the table. He got up from the table, took off his robe. I'll be doing that. Wrap a towel around his waist. I'll be doing that. And poured water into a basin. We'll be doing that. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet. We'll be doing that. Drying them with the towel he had around him. We'll also be doing that. Now many things are happening. In the scripture portion, in this one simple little move of Jesus, he did so many things. Firstly, Jesus must have discerned the quiet dispute among the disciples as to who could be considered to be the greatest. Who among them was the goat? Who among them was the greatest of all time? G-O-A-T. Not Ronaldo. Nor Messi. So they were struggling with this. Identity discovery. They want to find out. And so Jesus quickly corrected them in the gospel of Luke in chapter 22, verses 25 to 27. Luke 22, 25 to 27. In this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people. Yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank. And the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important? The one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course. But not here. For I am. I am. Among you as one who serves. Every time that Jesus says, I am, he always say it with that voice. You know why? It's Yahweh. You see, when Moses asks God, so what I'll tell them, what's your name? And God says what? I am. I am, I am, I am. Who I am, I am, I am. So Jesus, every time he goes and he says, for I am, he's declaring that he and God are one. Among you, as one who serves. Now there must be a paradigm shift for believers, so we can prevent ourselves from pursuing self-promotion and earthly accolades, earthly rewards, earthly congratulations, but staying relentless for the prize that awaits us in the kingdom. Secondly, he then took off his robe of a rabbi. Is the robe of a rabbi what? These Orthodox Jewish uh, uh, teachers, these real rab, rabbi, they have those markings on their robe, especially on their talit. It looks a little different. Okay? So, he then took off his robe of a rabbi, which was a badge of his authoritative identity, symbolizing how he emptied himself of his divine power so he could be among them as a man and not a mighty God. Listen, we too need to strip off any trappings of this world that could weigh us down from running the race and striving for a higher calling in Christ Jesus. We should reject anything that will disqualify us from being cloaked with this rope of righteousness eventually. Amen? Don't run for the rope of this world, the rope of religion, the rope of judging people. Right now, thinking that that's the best thing for you to do. No. Look for the rope of righteousness that you will eventually find in Christ. Thirdly, he wrapped a what? A towel around his waist, immersing himself in the task at hand and identifying with those who are marginalized and ostracized as the least in society because of poverty, financial constraints, or lack of status. 
Was this his argument for the dignity of labor? Perhaps. But he made it quite clear that I was striving for a top dog position and one upmanship will never bless anyone, least of all ourselves. If you try to climb up the social ladder, you'll eventually find that the top of the ladder is a very lonely place. It's a very barren place. And in fact, it is a place where you can bless nobody. Amen. Now, he meant every word when he said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verse 26 to 28, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, once we learn how to serve from the heart, from here, we express the presence of the Lord from us to others. And there is an extension of his grace that will help many to encounter him. You know what? Many of us, we try to reach out with only what we have learned from here. That means you come up with head knowledge and you try to argue with people why they should come to your service, why they should go to church with you, why they should attend Bible study with you. Forget the argument. Release the love of Jesus that you have in the inside of your heart. It will pull them closer. Amen. Fourthly, as he poured water into a basin, he indicated that this was not just a mere ritual, a, a ritualistic effort to fulfill religious demands. But he was seriously committed to going the whole course of washing dirty feet and getting them not just clean, but wholesome and faithful. Why? Listen, you see, he's not just washing just with plain water. He is washing with the anointing that flows from the inside of him so that those feet will not just be clean, but they will be wholesome and faithful so they could respond to his call of carrying the message of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. I think he will need more than a small amen. If you go with me to Isaiah chapter 52 verse 7 and read this with me. How beautiful in the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. So you see, foot washing, it's not just, just to clean your feet. It's to ordain your feet so that you can go to the world, preach the good news to the ends of the earth. Amen. So you see, foot washing, it's not just, just to clean your feet. It's to ordain your feet so that you can go to the world, preach the good news to the ends of the earth. Amen. Now he was never so concerned about cleansing the flesh, but he was more about preparing the spiritual in his disciples so they can follow his lead into kingdom exploits and triumphs. See, you see, foot washing, it's not just, just to clean your feet. It's to ordain your feet so that you can go to the world, preach the good news to the ends of the earth. Amen. We must learn to be as diligent as, he, as we claimed his promise. In John chapter 7, verse 38, he said, whoever believes in me, rivers of living water, will flow from within them. Hallelujah. From the day that I gave my life to the Lord Jesus and he called me into full-time ministry, from that very moment, I felt a rumbling in here. It was not gas. It was not acidity. It was not hunger. It was the anointing, the rivers of living water. Fifthly, he then dried their feet 
with the towel that was wrapped around him. Showing us that our full turnaround and breakthrough will be manifested only when we are drawn so close to him. That we are totally in sync with him. Washed but wet feet will quickly collect dirt and dust if they are not dried properly. I learned that the hard way when I visit the beach. When you the water is hitting your feet, very happy. And they look very clean. They almost look white. But as soon as you step out of the water and you start walking, you look at your feet. Ah! Sand is sticking all over. Why? Because wet feet collects all kind of dirt. Not just sand. Anything else. So washed but wet feet will quickly collect dirt and dust if they are not dried properly. All our commitment to being born again, baptized, Bible study, prayer, attending church and ministry, fasting, tithing and serving will never bear fruits until we are fully focused and joined with him intimately. While his wiping of their wet feet demonstrated his love and commitment to their well-being, yet it is the yielding of their bare feet for him to not only wash but to dry their feet that they start giving him access and make themselves vulnerable to all his will and his ways. The first time when they give their feet for him to wash, it was a part of the ritual. All the Jews would do that. But when Jesus took the towel from his waist and start wiping them, he's drawing them closer to his belly, which was flowing with rivers of living water. As he dries them, they're dry, but they're wet spiritually with the rivers of living water that flows from his belly into their feet so that now they become anointed feet that goes into all of the world and preach the good news. Amen! Amen. After washing all 12 pairs of feet, Jesus asked his disciples, in John chapter 13, verse 12 to 15, he said, do you understand what I was doing? Hey, do you know what I was doing? I think Peter was the first one, as always. You are washing our feet. And Jesus said, you called me teacher and Lord. And you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you now ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Come on, say this with me. Do as I have done to you. You leave from here today, remember to just do as he has done to you. If you leave from here and he has not touched you, you don't have to do anything. Because you've not been touched. You've not been influenced. There is no manifestation. You've not been healed. You've not been delivered. So you don't have to do anything. You get a free pass to go back into the world. Go back into your religion. Go back into those dirty friends who influence you with all dirty things. No problem. But if this evening you get touched. You get healed. You get delivered. You get sanctified. Then go and do likewise. Amen. Christ expected foot washing among his disciples to never be just a once in a year religious ritual. But rather a continual commitment and even a lifestyle. Sadly, many churches and ministries have completely ignored washing each other's feet as a symbol of Christ's attitude of humble service. Paul urged us in Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. What did he say? Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, 
If any comfort from his love, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. When we look at others as being worthy of our love and respect, and when we actively look for ways to serve their interests instead of our, only our own, we begin to develop the Christ-like mindset of humility and service. The foot-washing mindset doesn't come naturally to most of us. Why? Our human, natural, our human nature, our human minds, naturally leads us to put our needs first before the needs of others. That's why being mindful of the needs of others takes effort. There are some steps we can each take to build and maintain the foot washing mindset Jesus wants from his disciples. First, treat each other as connected. Treat each other as connected. Paul explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 20 that in the church there are many members yet one body. If you're a member of the King's Church Central, you may be a member, but you're a part of the whole body. So if any one of you are sick, the whole body gets sick. If any one of you are in doubt and confused, then the entire body is in doubt and confusion. If any one of you are suspicious and angry and offended, then the entire body will also be suspicious, angry and Confounded, offended, sorry. So when we become part of God's church, we join a spiritual body to which every Christian is connected. It is a two-way street. What affects our neighbors affects us and vice versa. Verse 26 goes on to say, if one member suffers all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. When we serve our others, we help the whole body, including ourselves. A single act of service can overflow into the lives of countless others. So therefore, if you feel that I do not want to go to that church anymore. You're hurting the entire body. If you feel that you need um, to, 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 to keep quiet and you do not want to contribute anymore to any things in the church, you're hurting everybody else. Be careful about that. Secondly, plan now what you'd like to harvest later. Serving others is a lot like planting seeds. Sometimes we can find ourselves serving and wondering if we're really accomplishing anything useful. The foot-watching mindset should lead us to serve others now, knowing that we are planting seeds of kindness, compassion, and generosity that will yield a harvest in the future. Remember the harvest is coming. And 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 6 says, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So we might not see the results of our service for months, years, or even decades. But that doesn't mean that the seeds aren't worth planting. You see, the seed is not your capacity, your capabilities, your knowledge, your wisdom. No. The seed is the gospel. Never forget that the Bible teaches us that the seed of God is the word of God. This is always good. This is always authentic. And so when you sow the seed, one day 
there will be a harvest. Galatians chapter 6 verses 7, 9 to 10. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So give your best. Subscribe. Contribute. I'm not just talking about money here. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about your talent. I'm talking about a shoulder for somebody to just cry on you. A listening ear. A thoughtful visit. Any help you can give them. Go ahead. You belong to the household of God. The household of faith. Number three. Following Jesus is more than an elect intellectual pursuit. An important part of being a Christian is studying the word of God. That is settled. But an even more important part is doing the word of God. After studying, you do. James chapter 1 verse 22 says, Be not be doers of the word and not hearers only. Jesus gave a chilling warning about the judgment that he would pass on those who failed to serve that you find in Matthew chapter 25 verse 41 to 43. Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. Remember, even before Jesus would wash his disciples' feet, a woman of disrepute had already washed his feet with our tears and wipe them with our hair. The disciples needed teaching. This woman of bad reputation had already practiced. She was not just reading the word, she was doing the word. Amen. The command to wash each other's feet ties into the fact that God expects all believers, all of us, to develop a continual focus on serving others the way Jesus served us. We must be ready even to sacrifice so we can give of our time and energy to help when and where we can. Simply saying that um, you will pray for someone's problem is never the nature of Jesus and his kingdom. It is never enough. Oh, I'll pray for you. But you forget to even do that. We just might be God's answer to our own prayers so that others can be blessed, they can be healed, they can be delivered, they can be provided for. The more we learned to do this, the better we will fulfill our teacher's instruction. What was it? Do as I have done to you. Ready to get done? Let's pray. Father, I bring every person in this room, every single souls and heart in this room to you. I ask for the blood of Jesus to cleanse and wash them and sanctify them right now. If there is anything in them that is not from you. Remove it straight away Lord. I ask that you will have free and full access Holy Spirit. Into the heart, into the mind, into the very soul of every one of us. And all those who are tuning in right now. Jesus I pray. Have full authority. To wash, cleanse and purchase. So that 
we can be made whole. We can become a part of your holy kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Use us. Manifest your glory and your grace. Touch us and impact us powerfully. Remind us that we are yours. And Jesus, I pray for this time of fellowship together. Teach us right deep down inside of our heart how we need not only just to cleanse ourselves in your holy blood, but when we receive the cleansing that comes from you, we can learn to help others to come to you too, to be cleansed by you, to be loved by you, and to be blessed by you. I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Sanctify every one of your servants who will minister. Sanctify the water. Sanctify the towel. Sanctify our hands. Sanctify our hearts. Speak through your servants. Let us hear a word of knowledge that will be profound, accurate, and radical so that lives can be changed and we can be made whole in you. I love you, Lord. And I know that this time has been ordained as we prepare to celebrate and to commemorate Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. Help us to be so influenced by you rather than by those who have their other agenda. May we be impacted only by you. For your glory, King Jesus, I ask. Hallelujah. Amen.